My name is Katie Service. I'm the airport manager. Um, with me tonight in back is Matt Ilya, the assistant airport manager. Uh, we also have our consultants who will be presenting tonight, Brian Massa and uh, Mark Nelson from Horsley Wicked Group in the back there. Um, thank uh, the folks at DEP, if you would just wave so people know who is here from DEP. Thank you. And uh, Dan Santos, director of DPW, is also with us this evening. Uh, just in order of um, how we're going to go about the meeting, we do have a sign-up sheet in the back of the room, so if you have not signed um, on that sign-up sheet, we can pass that around so people can um, sign in. Uh, we also have a handout. Uh, basically, these are the slides. Um, the handout gives you an opportunity to jot down some notes on each slide, so we can go back to any of the slides that you have questions on. What we will do is we will proceed with the presentation. That should take us about 45 minutes for Brian to get through the presentation. Uh, after the presentation, then we're going to open up the floor um, to questions. Because we are recording this, um, we have Stone in, in the back that's recording uh, this video. If you do have questions, we'd just like you to raise your hand, come up to the podium, ask your questions so that it's uh, clearly heard on the video and then Brian or Mark or myself will respond to you also at the podium. So I would appreciate that. With that being said, Brian, um, why don't you come on up and uh, start with your presentation. All right, thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here. I know that uh, the weather hasn't cooperated too much. All right, so kind of the first thing is, um, and again, this presentation will be available to everybody online, but there's two locations that everybody can get copies of all the reports that the airport has filed. Um, the first one is the airport's website. They've got a page uh, dedicated to PFAS. Um, there's reports up there that you can download and review. Uh, the reports are also available online for MassDEP. That's the hyperlink that can bring you there with the RTM. And then uh, for the purpose of the report that we're going to be discussing today, we're going to be accepting comments on it until January 19th. All right, so just a little, a little background. So the airport began investigating PFAS in 2016 at the request of Mass DEP. And what had happened, uh, the previous year, uh, EPA had had all the large water utilities test for PFAS, which was an American contaminant, uh, to see how it was distributed throughout the country and it was detected in the, in the my drinking laws. Uh, so between 2016 and 2023, uh, the airport delineated the nature and extent of the PFAS impacts related to its historic use of aqueous foam foreign foam, also known as AFFF. Uh, they collected over 131 soil samples, 210 groundwater samples, uh, fire truck wash samples, and three surface water samples of PFAS analysis. So the presentation is going to focus on the timeline, the investigation work that was done, a brief background on what PFAS is, a uh, discussion of aqueous foam forming foam, which is the source of PFAS detected at the airport. And then we're going to discuss the nature and extent of the PFAS impacts that we identified. Uh, we'll also discuss two caps uh, that were installed to prevent the further leaching and impact to our wells. Uh, those two caps were installed in two areas known as the deployment area in the airport rescue and firefighting building area. Uh, those areas were identified as the two major sources of PFAS relating to the historic use of AFFF. Uh, we'll also talk about PFAS plume that, that was completed uh, for us to um, delineate the nature extent and to also uh, determine where the plume would move in the future. And then what the next steps are with the airport plans to do in the future. So here's kind of the timeline of, of what was done and the amount of work that the airport did. So as I had indicated previously, in 2016, uh, Mass DEP did a RFI, a request for information from the airport to determine if it was one of the potential sources that was impacting the model wells. Uh, in September, the airport provided the information documenting that they in fact used AFFF, a, a known uh, material containing PFAS. Uh, in November, Mass DEP required the airport to do an IRA to need the nature extent of PFAS identify where its source areas were. And in December, the airport provided a plan that was going to document that and what the next steps would be. Uh, in 2017, the airport filed its first IRA status report. So these status reports are reports that are due to Mass DEP 
meeting every six months. And what they do is they basically document the work that the airport has done. So all these reports are available uh, online and on the airport's website, and they kind of document what was done during that six month period. Uh, in October, so you still see kind of our RAF status reports are due in April and October. That's kind of the six months of my friend. Uh, in October, we did IRA status report number two. And then in November, we submitted the phase one report. So there's, there's five major steps in the MCP, and I'll get to that in a minute, where you can kind of see their milestones as you move through the process. Uh, in 2018, we submitted two more IRA reports. Uh, in April, we submitted again two more IRA reports, and the public had petitioned for the site to become a PIP site. So um, once a PIP site, once a site is designated a PIP site, is when the public becomes involved and gets a chance to comment on uh, what would be milestone phase reports, which is what the airport's been doing uh, since 2019. What does PIP mean? Public involvement plan site. So uh, in 2020, uh, we did two more uh, these IRA status reports. Again, these reports document soil worms that were installed, groundwater data, kind of everything that was done during the six month period. We also submitted the draft two report. The draft two is a comprehensive site assessment that's uh, determining the nature and extent of the plumes and what we had identified. Um, that was submitted as draft because at this point we're in the PIP process and we're giving the public a chance to to comment on that. In 2021, we submitted the final phase two report as well as two other IRA status reports. In 2022, uh, we revised the phase two report based on some comments that we received from MassDEP. Uh, we also submitted two more IRA status reports and a phase three report. The phase three report is kind of what uh, the potential remediation will be for the site, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, then in 2023, we submitted the final phase four. Uh, phase four is actually what the uh, remediation is going to be. So for this particular site, the risk is being managed by ongoing treatment that's happening at Lamar Wells. Uh, we also submitted another IRA report, and the report that we're talking about today is the draft report 14, uh, an IRA completion statement, meaning that the airport has delineated the nature and extent of its PFAS impacts. It has uh, mitigated its soil impacts with uh, protective caps that are preventing the further leaching. And the risk of contaminated drinking water is being managed uh, by the well treatment system, which is providing um, drinking water that meets mass CEP requirements to the top. So this is kind of the, the MCP timeline. So it starts off when there's an uh, initial notification, that's in 2016 is when it occurred. And kind of each one of these points that you see are, are milestones as you move through the MCP process. So the airport is right here. It's completed phase three and phase four, and now it's going into phase five, which is the monitoring of the remediation, remedial operation status. Uh, they'll stay in that phase until they reach a permanent solution. Based on the modeling that we've done, we've estimated uh, that it'll take about eight to 10 years for the plume to completely flush itself out and, and, and be gone. But again, we're continuing to monitor that every six months. So just because we're moving out of the IRA doesn't mean that we're not going to continue monitoring. The airport's going to continue doing monitoring every six months and it gets submitted into a phase five report. Uh, you can also see this is the other site. That's another PFAS site in the area. the Barnstable Fire Treating Academy. You can kind of see that they're right at this point right now where they're still working on delineating the nature and extent of their impacts. So what is PFAS? So PFAS is an emerging contaminant. Um, an emerging contaminant is basically a, a contaminant that we know that there's issues, but there's not too much uh, data about it. We know that it's a man-made fluorine chemical. It's water, grease, and stain resistant. And it's resistant to breakdown, which is where the forever chemical comes from. It migrates easily and the bio accumulates. So one of the issues is that once it gets into groundwater, it moves extremely quickly and it doesn't degrade. So currently, Mass DEP regulates six PFAS analysts. Those are the six up there. Uh, current. Sorry. Uh, Mass DEP currently regulates six PFAS analysts. The laboratories report about 40 or so. Um, the airport is testing for all 40. 
Uh, we report a couple different things in our regulatory report. So when you look at them, you'll see the sum of six. That refers to the sum of these six analytes that are what MassDEP is currently regulating. Uh, we document 6,2 FTS, that's 6,2 fluorotolomer. So 6,2 fluorotolomer is one of the key unregulated PFAS analytes that we use to track the progression of the airport's bloom. Uh, it's called environmental forensics, so it's, it's an analyte that we can use to distinguish that bloom, and we can monitor that as the bloom migrates. Uh, we also report total PFAS, which is the sum of all the, the laboratory reported analytic results. Ryan, before you skip ahead, how does this differ from the federal EPA, the mass DEP? So initially, DEP chose six analytes. Five of these six were in the EPA's initial testing, and then they added another one different from EPA. Uh, EPA was only regulating the two big ones, the PFO and PFAS. So mass DEP went beyond what was being regulated by EPA and made more stringent requirements, which is what this is. So at the time when the rule came out, it was PFO and PFOS, 70 parts per trillion. Uh, mass DEP is the sum of these six analytes for 20 parts per trillion. Thank you. Okay. So one of the issues that you have when you're doing a PFOS investigation is that PFOS is in a lot of our products. And it makes it very difficult to determine sources because PFOS can be introduced. It's in because of our material. So if you look at this list, it's almost an all-consumer products. Uh, so when we do sampling, we have to take a lot of care to determine that we're not uh, introducing contamination into this, and that what we're seeing is actually related to a release and not what we would call a background. Um, PFAS has become ubiquitous in this area. We did a lot of testing, um, you know, upgrading, downgrading, cross-grading to the airport, and we're finding uh, PFAS in soil from <laughs> areas that weren't even associated with the airport, where there was no known source. And again, it kind of goes back to all of these various sources where PFAS can come from. So the PFAS that was identified at the airport is related to the historical use of aqueous foam forming foam, also known as AFFF. It's used for emergencies when there's an accident that involves petroleum, it's for life-saving and fire control purposes. It's also required by the FAA. Uh, currently, there's no other PFAS-free option. The FAA is looking at uh, fluorine-free options. Um, the airport, on its own, had looked at some of these fluorine-free options, not the one that FAA is looking at, but um, other non-fluorinated products, and we found that they do contain pretty high levels of Brian, can I just stop? Can everybody hear Brian, or do we need to turn up the microphone? I think everybody can. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. So one of the things that we had done when that we said... That is better, thanks. <laughs> I turned it up a little bit. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the things that, uh, that we had done when we started this work back in uh, 2016 was to interview uh, airport staff who had worked at the airport since the 1980s to try to figure out where was AFFF used? Was it used in multiple locations at the airport? Was it used um, in one location? What type of AFFF did they use? We reviewed purchase records, and we found that for the last 20 years, it was the same type of AFFF that was used as a floor tolerant based model. Uh, we also found out that um, AFFF began being used in 1991 and was used um, every three years to 2012. So there was a couple different things at the airport where AFFF was used. Uh, the first of these triannual events at MCI, Mass Casualty Incident Training, where um, every three years the folks from the airport would get together and they would do a mock aircraft accident, some other type of aircraft accident where they would respond to, and part of the response training was to use AFFF, just like there was an actual fire, to get the firefighters used to responding and to use that type of material. Uh, we also found out that with the exception of one of these locations, uh, they were all done in the deployment area. Um, between 2004 and 2015, the airport also used AFFF annually. So this is in addition to the first one where it's happening every three years. Uh, between 2014 and 2015, the FAA required the airports to go out and spray foam from their fire apparatus to verify that it met the consistency requirements, which was 3%. Uh, so that, again, was done until 2015. In 2015, um, 
people started to learn that PFAS was a potential issue. We're in a drinking water supply area. So in 2015, uh, the airport stopped using AFFF for training purposes. Um, there's been two emergencies uh, where AFFF has been used. Uh, in 1991, there was an off-aircraft accident. And then in 2016, there was an accident. Um, the 2016 accident was up front. That was closed through Mass DEP. So in 2016, the airport purchased what's called an ecological <coughs> card. So what this card allowed them to do was to verify that their firefighting apparatus could make the 3% foam consistency and would work in the event of emergency without actually spraying foam. Um, the airport purchased this unit before it was approved from FAA because they wanted to be good environmental stewards and it eliminates the use for them to spray the foam. So this is something where now they can plug this unit into their, their RF vehicles, their airport rescue firefighting vehicles, and verify that the mixing valve actually mixes how it should. So in 2016, this is the, the accident that I was talking about that happens. Um, no AFFF had been used on the airport uh, for training purposes. The last time it was used at the airport was in 2016, which is in response to this accident. Uh, there was 10 gallons of foam concentrate that was used. It was to the asphalt. It got captured into a catch basin. The catch basin, this asphalt was cleaned out, and the report was submitted to Mass DEP as an emergency response action and then a permanent solution. So this site has been closed. So one of the things that we found out is when we started to do this investigation, everywhere that we tested, we found PFAS. We found PFAS hydraulically upgrading to the airport where there's no connection to the airport whatsoever. We found it cross gradient where again there would be no connection to the airport and we also found it down gradient. So we needed to figure out a way that we could look at the data to figure out well is this PFAS background? Is this from you know historical products that we've used, atmospheric deposition, other things that have caused this contamination in groundwater or is this consistent with the airport's firefighting fault? Is it other industrial sites? Um, wastewater treatment plant, Barnstable Fire Training Academy releases that haven't been occurred. So one of the things that we did was uh, we did environmental forensics. So I've been doing environmental forensics for probably the last 15 years or so. It's a pretty common thing. Um, not so common, more common these days, but when this work first came out, folks weren't really doing environmental forensics on PFAS yet because it was still an emerging contaminant and people were trying to figure out you know, just what to do. Uh, so we developed a way to determine chemical signatures based on the analytical results by normalizing the data set. So one of the key things that made um, this possible is that the airport was running the full analytical list of the foreign airlines and not just looking at what was regulated by Mass DEP. So by looking at that list, we could see where there was differences. And it came back to one of the substantial differences was that 62 fluorotolomer, which made sense because the equity purchase record showing that they purchased a fluorotolomer based one for the last 20 years. So we were able to generate these what we call radar plus functional initiative really, for every single groundwater monitor example that we collected. So we could look and see where there were similarities and where there were differences. So these are the two areas where we identified um, PFAS related historic use of AFFF. Uh, we had put soil borings all over the airport. We investigated uh, historic use um, in 1991 where a training event had occurred that wasn't on the deployment area. We investigated that area. We investigated um, the former airport rescue and firefighting building that had been uh, constructed prior to this one. And basically what we had done is we put soil borings all around this area to delineate the extent of PFAS impacts above the regulatory standards. So you can kind of see these lines right here identify the location where this impacts in soil that's consistent with the hip or airport's historic use of firefighting foam. And then you have these other locations where this PFAS detected. It's not above regulatory standard, but it's consistent with stuff we had found in a background study where we had looked around the area and found that you can have PFAS in the soil because of these other atmospheric deposition unknown releases um, that look different because it's from a different type of signature. So another thing that you'll notice too is that the caps that I was talking about, that's what these hashed areas are. So when you look at this data, you can see that you know, 
focused in this area and focused in that area over there was really where the really high levels of PFAS was, and it was related to the historic application of AFFF. So this is where they would do their you know, triannual events. This is where they would go and spray to verify that their fire trucks were working. So in uh, beginning, I think, in 2019, um, Mass DEP sent a request to the airport to do additional IRA activities to um, prevent the further migration of PFAS and groundwater through installing a cap, a barrier, or some other way to prevent it. Uh, so we did a fair amount of, of research because, again, PFAS is in almost everything that you can imagine. So the last thing that we wanted to do was to use a geomembrane liner that contained PFAS. So we tested various geomembrane liners and, and did leaching tests to find out ones that didn't actually have PFAS in them. And we ended up uh, installing two caps. So um, the caps were installed. One was a plastic liner. Uh, that's in the deployment area. That's the really big area. And I'll show some pictures of the cap insulation so you guys can see what that looks like. And then we installed the second cap, which was an asphalt, um, asphalt cap. And both, prevent, uh, both caps prevent rain from leaching through these areas, which contributes to the groundwater impacts. So this is the deployment area cap. So this area that you see right here was all you know, vegetated, basically. And this is where they would go and they would do their exercises. So one of the first things that we did was we had to put down a sand buffer layer. And we started to lay down these 30 mil geomembrane liners. These are pretty thick material. They get welded on site, so these are all, all fused together. So this becomes one full, complete sheet. So that's kind of an area review of, you know, we're, we ended up capping this whole thing that you see in sand all the way over to there as well. This is kind of a side view of the cap in place. And now we're starting to go finger out and put in uh, the sand buffer protective layer. This is just kind of another, you know, another view of it. And then this is us um, you know, verifying um, the thickness of the sand after we put it through it. One of the things that we do too is these caps get inspected every six months. Um, so every six months we go to these areas that have been capped and we look to make sure that there's no divots in the ground, that the caps aren't exposed, that there's no cracks in the asphalt. Because as you'll see in the next slide, these caps are actually working very well. The concentration of PFAS has dropped drastically in these areas after the caps were installed. Uh, so this right here is the, the installation of the cap near the off building. We did uh, community dust monitoring during this entire project to make sure that we weren't sending you know, potential PFAS laden dust you know, during construction purposes. So um, the construction was very slow. A lot of care was taken to not generate dust and to monitor it so that we weren't sending uh, PFAS impacts anywhere else. And then this is um, you know, what the cap is looking like right before we put the asphalt down. So this is the graph. There's a monitoring well, uh, HWI, that's directly down gradient of the deployment area. This is the location that had the highest concentrations of PFAS. And again, when you look at this graph, this blue line right up here, these really high concentrations, this is the unregulated analyte. And then um, you can see the, the orange line right here. These are the regulated analytes by mass DEP. So this red line right here is when we put the cap in. So you can see that there was a trend concentrations were uh, increasing for total PFAS. This is all PFAS analytes, not just the six regulated by mass DEP, but, but everything. And you can see once the cap gets installed, you see a drastic drop in total PFAS in 6.2 fluorotolerant. And then what happens is when you install a cap, it is what we call like the capillary fringe or smear zone, where this contamination that still is in place and this groundwater comes up and down, you flush that source out. So you can see that the correlation of ups and downs correlate with the groundwater going up and down. And we expect that over the next maybe year or two, we'll start to see that we'll get more of these smaller peaks. They'll continue to get smaller and small bounce up. So this is kind of the, the various plumes that we identified during our investigation. So as I had said earlier, when we were drilling, we were finding PFAS impacts everywhere. So we put some monitoring wells up here. This is hydraulically upgrading. And so these blue lines indicate groundwater flow direction. And in general, groundwater is kind of flowing this way with everything going to the monowells. wells. These ME1, 2, and 3, those are the drinking water supply wells. 
So we started drilling up here, and we found that, well, this PFAS exceeding the regulatory values up here. We came down uh, to Wendy's, which was hydraulically cross gradient to the airport, and we found that there was PFAS impacts there. These impacts are extremely deep. There's impacts in the shallow groundwater, which is, you know, five feet into groundwater. Groundwater is maybe 25 feet out here. And then there's impacts going all the way down to 100 feet into groundwater. So this, these are pretty big plumes that, you know, based on the depth, seem like they're coming from far away. So we identified this first plume, this cyan plume, where we have no idea where it's coming from, but we know it's initiating you know, somewhere beyond the airport, and it's going you know, somewhere down this way. We don't have points beyond uh, the rotary, but we know that that plume is going down here and goes to the Mott Wells. Uh, we also identified the Barnstable Fire Training Academy's plume that's up here in purple. So we put monitoring walls um, up here, and we found that um, their plume was kind of coming down, cutting across the airport, going underneath the deployment area, and then also going down to my wells. So we identified those two plumes. And then these other two plumes that you see in green, those are the plumes related to the airport's use of AFFF. And again, we were able to do this all through environmental friendliness, which I'll get to in a minute. Before you go ahead, Brian, could you please tell me where the extent of your testing is? Yep, so it's probably hard to see, but you see every one of these red dots, those are all monitoring wells. And these are clustered monitoring wells. These are wells that, you know, that one dot, maybe four wells that are screened in different intervals and tremie grouted. So when we were looking at this, we weren't just installing a monitoring well five feet into groundwater and and just calling it a day. We were, you know, tremie grouting these things so that we could look at multiple depths to see if the plumes changed, you know, based on where they were in the aquifer. So, so in other words, there's nothing off, there were no monitoring done off the airports. There was. There was. We installed monitoring wells in the town right of way. So we got permission uh, from the town to install wells within the road. So if you look up here, this is an industrial area. This black outlines the airport property. So we went into the, uh, the town-owned right-of-ways and installed monitoring wells in the roads. Um, you know, we also did that down, you know, down here in Wendy's, uh, down here at the Rotary. There's a cluster group of monitoring wells right down there. That was town-owned property. Um, down water department property, we installed wells up there. Up in this area was difficult. This industrial park area is partially private, so there are no town roads in there, which is why we only have a couple monitoring wells there. But again, we've, we put in multiple monitoring wells off the airport property to figure this out. Great. So this is kind of a, a what I call a radar flop. This is a quick way that you look at the analytical data and see variance. If you only look at the six regulated compounds, you're never going to figure out if you're the source, if this is a commingled source, if there's plumes stacked on each other. So one of the things that we did was to uh, normalize our data sets. So we had done total PFAS, which was the sum of all the 40 PFAS analytes. And then we divided each PFAS analyte by that sum to get a normalized data grouping that was all on the same scale. So this is percentage based. And you can see that there's these various types of signatures. So this signature right here, this is the airport source area. And you can see it's basically a straight line going up to 624 atomer. And that's because 80 to 90% of the PFAS analytes associated with a fluoratomer based foam is 62 fluoratomer. You can look at Marwell 2, and you don't see that big spike there. This was back in 2020. So we had done some hydraulic analysis using mod flow. We had monitoring wells that were able to chase the airport's plume about 700 feet away from the Mar wells but we didn't have access to go the rest of the way because it was all privately owned property. So we knew that there was kind of this 700 foot gap, plus or minus, where we knew the airport's plume was somewhere in the middle, but it hadn't made it to the Mar Wells yet. So we predicted in about two years, based on a groundwater flow direction of about 300 feet per year, that the plume would get there. So what you see is, in 2022, you see a change. So you can see the plume looks like this, now all of a sudden you see that big 6-2 fluoratolomer spike there. So that's showing that now the Mar Wells is mixing these two plumes together. It's pulling what this plume was, and then it's mixing it with the airport's plume, changing the signature. So just for, for reference purposes, you can see that 
Barnstable Fire Training Academy signature when I looked at their data. We did this with all of their data set as well. Their signature you know, has this uh, PFA hit to it, PFAS. And these are very, very similar, but not like this. And now it's like this. So just for some comparison purposes. So the regulatory limit for mass DEP GW1 is 20 parts per trillion. This is a, a very small amount. Um, that number is protective of drinking water. GW3 is the next applicable regulatory standard, and that is uh, protective of surface water. And that concentration ranges from 500 to 40,000 because it's analyte specific. It's not looking at just the the sum of the analytes is actually individual for each of the six regulated compounds. So at the airport, the highest concentration ever detected of the six regulated analytes is 1.29. So obviously that exceeds the GW1 standard, but it's less than the GW3 standard. The Fire Training Academy is 205, so it's you know, almost 200 times, 150 times. The industrial park area, again, we did limited investigation up there. That's about twice the regulatory standard. And then the rotary uh, near Wendy's is almost four times the regulatory standard. So all of these areas are converging down to the Marwells. So based on some analysis that we had done, we did particle tracking. Um, we did pump tests. We determined the groundwater flow using a retardation rate was about 285 feet per year. We know that the Fire Training Academy went into operation in about 1959, and AFFF becomes about mid 1960s or so based on ITRC. Uh, the airport's first recorded use of AFFF is 1991, and then it's used every three years between 91 and 2012. Uh, we also know that they use it between 2004 and 2015, and then an accident in 2016. So some general um, travel times. So the travel time from the Barnstable Fire Training Academy to the Mary Dunwells, those are the closest wells, is about 5.6 years. Uh, travel time from the Fire Training Academy to Mar Wells is about 26 years. Uh, travel time from the airport to Mar Wells, about eight, eight, almost nine years. And travel time from the wastewater treatment plant to Mar Wells is about 32 years. Now these are all estimates based on using a groundwater flow of about 285 feet per year. So this is the model of the EPOS PFAS plan. So what we did is because there's PFAS throughout this area, we ran our model using the highest concentrations that were detected at the two source areas at the airport. We used HWP, which was the monitoring well that was installed uh, in the airport rescue firefighting area. And then we used the monitoring well installed um, in the deployment area. And we used the highest concentration in that. So the, the scenario shows that the plume goes right down this way and heads to Marwell 2. It doesn't impact Marwell 1 and 3. And the environment, the forensics support this. You do not see the airport signature in Marwells 1 or 3. You do see it in Marwell 2, which does get impacted on the side. Um, the other thing that we did is we only used the airport spoon because we know there's other PFAS in this area and we needed a way to distinguish what the highest concentration would be from the airport spoon. So in running this model, the model suggests that by the time it makes it to Marwell 2, the concentration through dilution and dispersion has dropped to just below the GW1 standard. And then by the time it continues down this way, it's about half of the GW2 standard. So for conservative purposes, we just assumed that, you know, this distance is so small that it is impacting Marwell too. This is kind of the three-dimensional cross-section showing, this is a, a multi-clustered well, HWI, you can see there's three different well screens there, and then there's multiple other clustered wells that aren't showed. And then it shows the screens from Marwell 2, and you can see that Marwell 2 is basically pulling the plume into the corner. If Marwell's 2 weren't there, it probably would have went, went by it. So what are the next steps at the airport? So we're moving into phase 5, which is um, remedial operation status. So 
the risk to drinking water is being prevented by the treatment plant that was installed at the Mar Wells. So there's no risk of drinking contaminated PFAS water. The treatment is occurring. They're meeting the regulatory standards published by Mass DEP. Uh, the input is capped. There are two known sources, a majority of them. So we know that the continued um, leaching of PFAS analytes has drastically gone down. Now we know that it's going to take a number of years for the plume to basically separate, detach from the deployment area, move and, and go out and be gone past Mary Dunn Wells. And we're estimating that may take up to 10 years. And so the airport is going to continue doing the groundwater monitoring every six months like they've done during the IRA. Uh, and they're also going to plan on inspecting the cap areas that they've done every six months. The group of monitoring wells that they test is the Mar Wells 1, 2, and 3. Uh, they also test the source area wells, and there's other wells in between the plumes so they can see the concentration drop as time goes on, which is what it's, what it's been doing. Uh, the airport is also uh, doing a financial contribution to support the treatment of MR wells because the, the cost of treatment should not be on the taxpayer. And this is treatment that's occurring to help the airport, so that's something that, that is taking place. As I previously said, the Arsenal continues to provide drinking water that meets Mass DEP regulatory requirements. And the highest sum of six concentrations at the airport are less than the GW3 standard, which is protective of surface water. All right. Sorry I had to rush through that, but I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. Because I know last time uh, we had done a presentation like this, the, the public really had some great questions. So I figured that we could spend the next hour, hour and 20 minutes or so talking about questions. So if anybody wants to come up, I'll turn the microphone over to you. And I've got my layout of the slides here, so we can defer back to any slides that may be helpful. Well done. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, holding the meeting, uh, Katie and town. Uh, Can we have an identification? This, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Tom Camberary. I'm a geologist. I've been working in the area for a number of decades, and uh, as uh, recently, uh, not as much recently, but from the beginning, been a researcher of the uh, fate and extent and transport of uh, PFAS compounds in Cape Cod groundwater. Tom, can I ask you, are you a resident? Or are you I, I'm a resident. I'm speaking for myself. For yourself. Knowledge professionally. And, and thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, again, thank, thanks again for having this meeting. It's a very important meeting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a whole important process, and, and you know, it's required by the uh, uh, oh, regulations that we do get, uh, that, that, they, that we have these types of meetings for public and uh, and uh, today's meeting is so we're kind of at the tail end of this process, and uh, I think uh, you know the uh, the Horsley, uh, the, the the group uh, together with the town has done a great job of uh, evaluating what the contamination is today, and they've done a great deal of work. Um, but I think um, it's not so circumspect about what had happened in the past, and um, so one can make a. a look and make a judgment and say, well, does it really matter what happened in the past? So I, I think it kind of does because you know, we have real high concentrations here, uh, you know, drink, potential drinking water routes and exposure, and, and as well as uh, potential uh, in the past, in the past, uh, that's all taken care of by the town. I saw Mr. Santos win some that, but since 2016, the drinking water has been perfect. But uh, in, uh, in, in not, in my opinion, evaluating uh, what's happened in the past, yeah, it leaves, uh, some, question, it leaves some question. It leaves some questions. It leaves some questions about um, what had uh, what the expo potential exposures were, and potentially you know, what mon the monetary contribution should be uh, as well. Uh, so. Uh, in, in that regard, um, I just want to go over just like six points, and, and I just have a little bit of time on that. So, so the, the, the study uh, purports that over 32 years of uh, annual training and, and activities releasing PFAS uh, to the ground, that it took 21 some odd years to migrate to the wells. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the 
employment uh, bloom has, they're saying, has just shown up with Lamar Wells in, in, for the first time in 2020. Well, so we've had 32 some odd years of, of uh, operation, and uh, I, I know uh, you know, that uh, it's been said that, well, a lot of the training has happened at the Fire Training Academy, but I also know that the Fire Training Academy was closed in the 1986 to, 19, to the mid-90s, as well, again, in the 2000s. So training took place somewhere else. So the Marwell uh, had high concentrations of this airport signature uh, prior to 2000, or in 2002, you know, it's, it's like 62 and, and 70 nanograms per liter, and, and also in Mill Creek. So uh, the phase two, um, the study uh, didn't quite indicate you know, why you know, it, it, uh, it, it wasn't from the airport, and, uh, and, uh, and, and why, you know, how, that, how, the, how did those compounds get into the downgrading wells and, and Mill Creek you know, prior to their reported time of when it entered the groundwater. Tom, if, if we could just get a response to that first point. Oh, Brian. Yeah. Thanks. Brian, can I point out that there's a motor or something that came yeah. on down the back just a little bit oh, ago, so right. it makes it, if you could it all speed up a little here. bit. Let me turn this up a little bit. Is that better? All right, so let me respond to, to Tom's comment. So we did substantial investigation developed a conceptual site model that's based on multiple lines of evidence. So the first line of evidence is analytical data and chemical signature. So there's a very specific chemical signature at the airport. Um, you can trace that signature down, you can follow it. It's ultimately made its way to the model wells. So to say that you know there was some other speculatory contaminant there, it doesn't follow the analytical data. So that's kind of the first piece to this. Um, the second part is that the feed and transport of PFAS at the airport is substantially different than the feed and transport at the fire training academy. So the fire training academy groundwater is much shallower. It's about 10 feet. They have extremely high concentrations in Flint Rock Pond, indicating that they may have sprayed foam into the pond. The uh, sediments have extremely high concentrations in the sediment, indicating that their plume made it to groundwater much, much faster than the airport's plume. Uh, the airport's plume uh, had to travel about 25 feet below grade. There's extremely high concentrations of total organic carbon um, in the in the surface, and the amount of time that it took to get through that is justified based on the analytical data that we have. We tested the soil going the whole way down and could see the profile match. We also know that the airport had purchase records for 20 years, indicating that the exact same foam had been used. Purchase records, same phone. So floor telemetry based phone. So they weren't using previous generations, other generations of phone. They were using a floor telemetry based phone, which coincides with the analytical data. Um, the second aspect of it is there was staff who worked at the airport since 1980. They were interviewed, and they indicated that phone had never been used at the airport prior to that because of cost and what was available to them. So they had no reason to spray it. There was no FAA requirement to spray up until the 90s. So they weren't doing that. So our multiple lines of evidence are based on more than just one thing. We've looked at various aspects of it. Um, the analytical data shows what the analytical data shows. There's a distinct plume chemical signature. It matches all of the data points that we've identified. You can see distinct plume signature coming onto the airport that matches the fire training academy. And you can also see a distinct signature that comes out from the wastewater treatment plant that also matches the fire training because again, the, the Mary Dunn wells are extremely close to the airport. So within five years, that plume would have hit Mary Dunn wells, where then it could have been circulated and back, to, back to the wastewater treatment plant. I'm just going back to the overall rock. So you can see these, these wells right here. So the release, Flint Rock Pond has extremely high concentrations of PFAS in, in both the surface water and the sediment indicating that the likelihood that this blue made it to groundwater extremely quickly is quite plausible. Can you stand a little to the side so we sure. can see what you're pointing at? So Flint Rock Pond right there has really high concentrations of PFAS in the surface water and in the sediment. So it's reasonable to figure that 
those concentrations help push the plume to groundwater very quickly. Then you have these grouping of wells right here that the travel says within five years, these wells would be impacted by the fire training company. Then this water gets circulated around town, goes to the wastewater plant, and then comes down this way. And again, you have a matching signature that's consistent with the fire training academy, both at Mar Wells, as well as down here by Wendy's, showing that these plumes are linked and a complete different chemical signature at Mar Well too, which is consistent with the airport. Thank you. I just have a couple more points, and then I would just like to go uh, get out of here. But this is the uh, the deployment uh, plume here, and this is the air rescue station plume here. And uh, the uh, the air uh, the, the report concludes that there was only a singular event that uh, uh, happened My here. Microphone closer. That, that there was only you. a singular event that that uh, uh, released uh, PFAS, and up here is. Triannual activities every three years with, uh, with releases as well as annual releases for uh, over 30 some odd years. And now we're just seeing this getting down here according to the conclusions of the of consultants. Uh, the, the, uh, the air has concentrations down here in shallow groundwater at, at about you know, 300 some odd uh, uh, nanograms uh, per liter of uh, and then uh, another one is about 100 as well. So we're kind of in the same vicinity. And this Mar Well 1 has concentrations of the airport signature at 70 nanograms per liter in 2020. And it also has uh, you know, PFAS as well. So my point was, is, well, how is that? Uh, never, it, it has not been explained to me. Uh, I cannot conclude that how that could not get to from the, from the air down to the Mar One with the airport's signature compound uh, to the to the Mar One. So a, a lot of what was is, is presented is, is the airport's plume, and there's a lot of attention on this. But uh, this one is a direct upgrading shot. The other thing is uh, is modeling. So the modeling, um, the modeling use of uh, the highest concentration in groundwater. 25 feet down, at about a thousand nanograms per liter of uh, the PFAS six, and uh, and what they did with the model was they said, okay, uh, that's what we have in the groundwater. We're going to put that thousand nanograms per liter in the, at the surface and, and and recharge it to the site to see what happens to it in the model. Well, the thing is, is that. PFAS, when it's used in AFFF, doesn't have concentrations of that what you might find in the, in the groundwater. If you look at, this, at, the, at the results of the testing of the equipment that Horsey Witten did, it was 120,000 nanograms per liter and, uh, in, the, uh, in, in AFFF that's being uh, in the equipment. The literature also shows that AFFF, being, as it's being used and deployed, is concentrations over 150 or hundreds of millions of nanograms per liter. So I, I take exception a little bit to the modeling and using just the groundwater concentration as the source concentration. And if you do that, you'll see that this plume disappears in the model because it's, it doesn't have a strength that's high enough that reflects uh, what the concentrations are in a triple F. The other thing, uh, and my, la my last point is the uh, uh, forensics analysis, and uh, I, I was uh, a little surprised that the forensics, and, and overall, it was a great job that you guys did putting together uh, this uh, with the, uh, the uh, uh, 6-2 floor caliber and distinguishing all that, but the uh, um, what we found in the um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the wells was uh, this 62 floor telomer that comes back and around. Oops, excuse me. Uh, here's a picture of the cap. And, and also, I, I would say, knowing what had happened at the fire training academy, right after the initial samples, we saw drastic drops even before a cap was put on. So there's lots of variation in those things. Uh, but 
so lots of things could explain things uh, in that. So with the uh, uh, forensics, if you look uh, at the chart, and, and I'll just show you this, Brian, is that um, I thought that the forensics, forensics report was was a, a little, was had some serious qualifications that they stated about their conclusions. And if you look at their plot chart of uh, where the uh, uh, those uh, three wells plus the Mar wells are plotted, they they all close plot very close together. Besides uh, HW. Uh, so that's uh, kind, of, kind of some of the notes that I have about this, and, uh, and you know, I've got to say that right now with the solution of treatment of the wells and uh, the capping, uh, there is no exposure right now. The right thing was done. Uh, the conclusion of uh, you know, no risk to public health is solid. I, my concern is what oh, happened, uh, what, what, what's the, the full, fuller story of the history of, of what had happened from the contamination in, in this area you know, from the airport. So those two points are the, the model and the forensic. Uh, Let me, I'll, I'll try to, to clarify on the, the forensics that Tom is talking about. So one of the other lines of evidence that we did was we submitted analytical samples to Patel Memorial Institute in Duxbury, which is a renowned laboratory for environmental forensics. They're able to look well beyond the 40 regulated analytes, and they have a list of about 500. So what they're able to do is look well beyond the, the type of plotting that I'm doing to look at are there other analytes beyond these 40 that we can see that are being detected so that they can look at the samples and determine the likelihood that they're related. So in that report, there is a scatter plot. And the scatter plot that Tom's talking about plots four or uh, five of the six samples as being AFFF samples, which makes absolute sense. These are AFFF sites. They're plotted slightly different because the foams aren't the same, but I would expect them to be plotted in the same way. All that graph indicates is that these samples are from an AFFF source. The last sample, it's a shallow monitoring well, is not from AFFF, it's another mixed source. Again, expected. What the report concluded is that the sample detected in Marwell HIV, which traces back to where the plume would be for the fire training academy. Again, their radar plot is consistent. That Patel report concluded that HWID is most consistent with all three detections of the Mar wells, not HWI shallow, which is representative of the airport source. So that again is just another line of evidence that we use to determine the extent. Um, the other thing that Tom is saying to, and I can let Mark talk about the model uh, next, but the model used the highest concentration detected in groundwater because there's other things that go on in the chemistry when AFFF is, is sprayed. Portions of it get held up in the soil because of the total organic carbons. Other analytes leach from it that are highly mobile in water. They don't all leach the same. So when you have a chemical signature that you can track that's in our source area, that's over a thousand feet away, and the chemical signature is the same, and then you see it show up there, and we have multiple years of groundwater monitoring, and the signature is stable, all goes back to matching that this was a fluoratolomer based foam. It correlates with the airport staff said that they weren't spraying foam in the 1980s, that they really did use it in 1991. We know that at least for the last 20 years it was a fluoratolomer based foam. So all of these multiple lines of evidence go back to support this conclusion. So it's pure speculation to say that, you know what, maybe, maybe they sprayed over here or they sprayed somewhere else. We've got no supporting information. We've put in soil borings all over the airport, and we weren't seeing other locations besides the deployment area and the uh, airport rescue firefighting building, which again, the analytical data supports the model. Um, using the highest concentration in groundwater is a reasonable thing to use because it's looking at what the loading was at the groundwater from that point and assuming that it's going to continue to leach at the highest concentration that it was detected at, which is an overestimate in my opinion, but that's what we were trying to do. Um, 
I can have Mark here. He's the he's the model specialist. He can give you some more details on the model. Well, much better than I probably can. Well, I think you covered a lot of what I was about to say. But good evening. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm with the Worsley Witten Group, and I wanted to just provide a little bit of additional info on this. One of the things I was going to say is the concentration we used in the model was the highest we saw in the source, which, as Brian has said, is reflective of what was sprayed at the surface and eventually made it to groundwater. And it was the highest number we measured ever in that location to understand how that flow moves. And yes, the foam concentrations in the soil at the surface and partway down are going to be different, and some of those will be higher. But it's reflecting what happens as that dissolves with the rainwater that's soaking through. If that cap wasn't there today, there'd be quite a slug of water soaking down on a day like today. So that's reflective of what's happening there. And then just here at the, the firefighting building, the release there it's not from a known spraying of foam for an accident or an exercise or something like that. It was occasional washing of the fire truck. And in finding some of the con contaminants in the soil there, we actually checked the firefighting water and realized that the valve on the truck had to be fixed because there was a slight leak of this stuff. And to get to 20 parts per trillion is very little. I think someone said in a presentation I heard that 20 parts per trillion is like one second in 36,000 years. So this is an incredibly small number that we're talking about here. So it's kind of just the washing and cleanup of the equipment that caused that. And it's not going to have a high concentration at the surface. It's low to begin with, and it's even lower when it reaches groundwater. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, other questions? Although I've been told coming back, oops, is that going? Is that better? I've been told that having been a former classroom teacher, you'd sit in the back of my room and not hear what I was going to say. I'm Christine Greeley. I have a question, and that I know that it's been repeated multiple times, about some kind of an unknown plume that originated up around Wendy's. I have a question, because that's also where the Cape Air hangers were. And was there any looking at, seeing whether or not um, some of what's being talked about there could have come from that? Um, and so that was my question. Thank you. Uh, to answer that, we, we absolutely did. So again, what we looked at is we took every single monitoring wall, and you can see there's there's a whole cluster of, of monitoring walls up here by all, all the Cape Air buildings, um, upgrading into that monitoring wall there. The well at Wendy's also has depth impacts that are like 100 feet below grade, indicating that this source is coming from somewhere far away, uh, meaning that it's likely from a release that's occurred somewhere over here to get that type of a release. So again, the forensic data for the deep wells support that um, it was likely coming from someplace far away, possibly the wastewater treatment plant that received wastewater from residential use. Um, we also believe that impact water may have been circulated from the Mary Dunn wells, again, five year time frame before a release would get there. And that the fact that we see it at 100 feet deep correlates back to it's coming from someplace far away. And we looked at those chemical signatures, and those chemical signatures that are at that depth matches what you see in Marwell 1. So Marwell 1 and Wendy's have the same forensic signature that's consistent with the Fire Training Academy. One thing to point out, too, is that the Fire Training Academy also has 62 floors in their in their release. But it's, at, it's not at concentrations that the airport has, which is why, um, again, if you look at the phase two comprehensive site assessment, there's a reasonable amount of forensic plots in there where at the time we included them as attachment and you can see. But their, their signature, if you look at their source wells, it's not just all PFOS. They have 6,2 fluorotolomer. 
but it's not upwards of 90%. It's at like a 10%. And you see that 10% along with PFAS, which isn't, you know, at the higher concentrations, it's not what the airport has. The airport does have all the regulated analytes, the PFO, PFAS, PFNA, but at much lower concentrations than what you're seeing at the Fire Training Academy. So when you see the radar plot, So you can see, when you look at this, you see all these little dots right there? Those are all the hits of the other analytes. So that's PFOA, that's PFOS, that's PFNA. This is a whole slew of different analytes. And the reasons that they're there is it's known that these fluorotolomer-based foams had these as contaminants from the tolerization process. So we expect it to be in there. But when you look at the concentrations, it is nowhere near the concentration of PFOS that you have over here. You know, this is upwards of 50 to 60 percent of that concentration that's at the fire tree academy. So we're talking fire tree academy was almost 200 or more than 200. Um, so you're talking 50 percent. So 50 that's that's still 50 times higher than what was detected at the airport concentration wise. So the fact that you have this again, it, it all follows the conceptual site model. You know, the airport does have those regulated compounds, but the the real high concentration is the 6,2 fluorotolomer, and that's what you use to track it. So you can see this 6,2 fluorotolomer right there, but this is consistent with the Fire Training Academy. They have small concentrations of 6,2 fluorotolomer in their data. It's at nowhere near a concentration like this. So when you see this happen, you can see that there's been a change in the chemistry, and that's because the total amount of PFAS has changed drastically because of the concentration of 6,2 fluorotolomer. Those are percentages. These are percentages because it gives you a normalized scale. Concentration doesn't matter for this. If you did this on a concentration, your scale would be different, but you get the exact same signature. To do it on percent, the scale is always the same. It's not concentration based. It doesn't need to be concentration based. This is a forensic signature. So you normalize the data. You don't use concentrations. Otherwise, you have plots that were at all sorts of varying sizes. So you do this because it's relative of the analyte's contribution to the total PFAS. That's classic forensic application. It's a normalized data set. So the airport had close to like 200 and some odd nanograms per liter of, of, of PFAS 6. 1.5. Yeah. 1.5. Micrograms per liter. Micrograms, so about 1,500. Yeah. And then the Marwell only has like 200. So that's how showing the bar well there, those lines, that is like, so that's only like less than 100 that the bar has, but the airport, you can see those little, little dots you are showing here, represents yes. a thousand. So it's just... Yeah, but you also have to keep in mind what the yeah. concentration difference is from the fire training academy. They're 200 times higher. So you have to compare things that are like, so yes, the the concentration of HWIS looks extremely high, and that's because it's fluorotolomer based, and there is exceedances of the regulatory compounds. But the Fire Training Academy is over 200 times the detection. So what this shows is that you know the airport's you know one part per billion, 1.5 part per billion that it had through dilution and dispersion. Same thing with the Fire Training Academy's plume; it's getting diluted and dispersed as it moves down to the Mar wells. In when it mixes and it gets pulled up in there, it's changing the chemistry, which is what you would expect it to do. So the airport's plume has now made it there and is adding PFAS analytes that weren't initially there, which is why you see a change in the signature. Because the concentration of 6,2 fluorotolomer is so high, it's 15%. It's knocked down the, the PFAS hit because it's adding that slug to it. And it's also adding other regulated compounds. It is. There's you know, the six regulated compounds are there. But the only way that you can track this plume is by using differentiating analytes in environmental forensics because the regulated compounds are everywhere. And this is all supported with multiple lines of evidence. You know, the 
the Patel report concluded the same thing, that monowells one, two, and three, the chemical signatures all match the fire treatment academy. And that's because their plume is coming in from two different directions. You know, back to, you know, they've got this plume that's coming down this way. And then speculation, these wells got impacted first, your water gets circulated around town, it goes to the wastewater plant, which is up here. All the particle tracks show that the wastewater plant feeds this area, changes groundwater flow because of the mounding, feeds this area and then comes down here. And we see these impacts consist with the fire training academy at 100 feet. And the forensic signatures match. They don't look like the airport signature because it couldn't have got there. So for how many years was one? Well, I'm sorry, can you just use the mic? Yes. Betsy Young, I'm a resident of Hyannis and the president of the Civic Association of Hyannis. Um, just a quick question around the timing of the water being released at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, during what years was that happening? Um, because it seems like a, a lot of distance to travel to get to those mar wells before the plumes from the airport got there. Yeah, I have a slide with those numbers that we okay. 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 So it's a very long time. So to get from the wastewater treatment plant to Mara Wells takes 32 years. But Fire Training Academy opens in 1959, and AFFF is being used in the 1960s. We know it takes about five years for it to get to Mary Dunn 1, 2, and 3. So it's completely plausible that by you know, 1970s, 1975, that water first hits the wastewater plant. Is that when the plant was opened? It's been opened, Dan would probably know better than me, but since the 20s, it's been open for a long time. So if that happened sometime in the 1970s, then sometime in early 2000s, you'd start to see the plume impacting marbles one, two, and three from a release at the wastewater treatment plant. The other thing to consider too is that the wastewater treatment plant is also receiving you know, residential discharges where we know that we have PFAS in our consumer products. So again, it's not like this is only the fire tree academy plume. There's definitely other unknowns that could be adding to this. You know, whether it's an undocumented release from an industrial area, our consumer products. You know, there's definitely other things. And again, the airport wasn't trying to pinpoint exactly who the source was. All we were trying to do was to show that there's multiple PFAS plumes in this area, and it's not just the airport, and that Mara Wells are being impacted by, you know, unknown sources beyond the airport, beyond the fire training academy. So that's what the point of this was. So the timeline, yes, it takes an extremely long amount of time, but the numbers make sense for it to happen. Um, the airport's, you know, about nine years away. You know, to Tom's point, it takes time. You know, it, there's 20 feet, 25 feet of soil that this plume, that the PFAS needs to move through before it hits groundwater. It had a much better chance of getting groundwater at the fire training academy due to its shallower depth, it's about 10 feet, in Flint Rock Pond. We know that Flint Rock Pond has high concentrations in, it, in the sediment. Um, the airport, it, it, the only way it got to groundwater was through multiple rain events. It would move, 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 move. And when we did analytical testing of the soil, you could see this where you'd have, you know, these higher concentrations, lower concentrations, higher concentrations, because as the water comes in, it's moving down and down and down. And you know, those type of things kept the PFAS in its source there until, you know, about nine years ago when it got to groundwater and it's, it's moved and impacted my well a couple of years ago. It's supported by the analytical data, the environmental forensics show it. The um, testing from Mattel shows that. Um, it correlates with what the fire um, folks have said, that they didn't spray foam prior to 1991. And it correlates with the 20 years of purchase records. They have purchase records in our phase one report that go back 20 years. You know, so we're talking 2000. So the airport knew from at least 2000 to now that they purchased floor tolerance based foam. 
which is a completely different type of foam and not what other fire departments may be using because it's an FAA regulated foam that they're using. Sir Burton Mock. I live at uh, Greenwood Avenue in Hyannis down by the West End Rotary. Um, I attended the meeting that you had and I liked what you said about could there be a collaboration? I mean, this work is amazing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could collaborate? Because I live near the pond that has the highest PFAs on Cape Cod, which is um, at the West End Rotary. By the way, there used to be a herring run there. Glass eel, blue crab, love it if they if the, the uh, if the U.S. government would continue to clean up as they started one end of uh, Joshua's Creek and Twinsboro, because to continue to clean up that area, um, wouldn't it be great if we could collaborate this work so that um, we get the science working for Cape Cod to protect um, our beloved Cape Cod's drinking aquifer. Um, we also have quite a growing number of people concerned about the uh, the wind farm and all the toxic chemicals being stored at the at the uh, there was just the meeting at the state um, EFSB and they seem to quickly pass through um, um, having having chemicals stored um, on on, its, on the soil that could be very close to our single aquifer. What I would like to see is the town, the airport, the fire station. There'd be a collaborative effort. We've got the science from Woods Hole. If we could all work together, because the work you've done is amazing, let's finish this puzzle and put it together so that we're, with this building that's coming to Cape Cod, we need to, if we're going to be supporting more people in Cape Cod, the water is something we really have to put first. And so the work that you folks are doing here is wonderful and grateful that you've done so much work. I'd like to see it be more of a collaborative effort with the government um, so that we can clean up Cape Cod instead of it get, continue to be degraded. Thank you. Oh, and I have one other. Sure. I remember when the um, airplane went into um, the TJ Maxx mall. With the, what happened with that? Did that? Was that part of a problem with our water when I mean, as they're growing the airport with accidents, I, I don't want to get off subject here, but is that something that could cause problems as well? Thank you. That was quite a while ago. I'm trying to remember how many years. 2000? Yes. St. Patrick's Day, as I recall. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, it, the plane ended up in the parking lot over there, and there was a fuel release that went to a, a drainage system that drains to Hyannis Harbor. Because we were actually, went down to the harbor to test to make sure nothing had come through. And, and nothing did, and it was a fairly enclosed drainage system. There were a couple tests of the soil in that area too. I'm not aware that any foam was used in that event. I don't know. I, I don't think and so. we don't. We had records going back into that time frame, so possibly, but I, I think it was mostly, at the time, it was looking at the fuel release and we found that it was very minimal and manageable. I'm just going to add to that. Um, thank you for asking your question, Roberta, but um, you may have noticed as you drive by that side of the airfield as you no, it's I tricky. muted myself. If you're driving past that side of the airfield, oftentimes people see a um, area that they think is a helipad. It's actually an engineered material arresting system. That pad was put in after that accident. It's a way to, if an aircraft were to go off the runway environment, it slows the momentum of the aircraft down. And that was just re redone this year. We actually just finished the project this year. So that was put in after that incident. But more important was my first question. That was an after thing I put in, was about a collaborative effort with the government. Uh, I think the government should be helping us out quite a bit here. Um, and with, with with the fire station, the town, and our science community, with this study, um, I think that this is something that we need to expound upon and collaborate. Is that a possibility? 
So right now, all of the information that we have gathered to provide this information for you tonight is um, available and on DEP's website. It's also on our website. It's information that Barnstable Fire Training Academy is using for their analysis as well. Um, so I would I, I leave that over to DEP because there's other industrial sites north of the airport that are not associated with our plume uh, that also need to be addressed. But that's more of a DEP question. Any other questions? Um, my name is Linda Bolliger. I'm with Hyannis Park Civic Association. The question that I have um, for you guys is could you point out the monitoring wells that are uh, monitoring what may be entering into Yarmouth? And, I, and you can point out the timeline so that we just sort of have a sense of that. Sure. Okay. Thanks. All right. So this is going to be hard to see, but the the grouping of monitoring wells um, that we have that, that would kind of show that. So here's groundwater flow direction. It's going this way, it's going to my wells. It's obviously, it's continuing uh, into Yarmouth. So our last grouping of wells that we have is we, we sample my wells one, two, and three. That's been part of our testing regimen for the last couple of years. Um, we've got a cluster grouping uh, of wells right here that's screened at multiple depths to see um, the depth of the plume, and these plumes are very deep. They're over 120 feet deep. You see it in, in multiple depths. You see it shallow, indicating that there's something close by, um, whether that's you know background, atmospheric deposition, other things, other sources, industrial areas. Um, but these, these wells do show that the plume is migrating down this way. So from the airport's perspective, what we had done with our modeling to, to figure out you know, this plume right here is we had to subtract out all of the other PFAS analytes just because there was no way for us to figure out what was what because there's, you know, plumes from up here that are coming over. There's plumes down here that are coming over. So when we ran our analysis, we ran it specific to what the airport's plume was. And what we had based our model on is that by the time the plume hits here, let me see if it, So this obviously is, is continuing into, into Yarmouth. So by the time it gets down to Marwell 2 right here, this hatching that you're seeing, this black and red hatching, that's exceeding the Massachusetts GW1 standard, this protective of drinking water. All of this yellow that you see out here, that's, that's half of the Mass DEP drinking water standard. So all of these numbers here don't exceed the most stringent regulatory value, which is the GW1. So the risk is being abated by the treatment at Marwell too because the, the GW1 exceedances, it's so close that we've, we just said yes, it goes, it goes to it. But as the plume continues to move, it's being diluted and dispersed. The concentrations start to drop. So the stuff that's entering Yarmouth from here, it's not exceeding any of the regulatory standards, but there's other PFAS analytes that we're not looking at, other sources, other plumes, that are contributing to this that we're we're not looking at. Would it include uh, Barnstable uh, Fire Training Academy PFAS? I think that the Barnstable Fire Training Academy is, is still working on their phase two comprehensive site assessment. So this is something that they're going to need to delineate. The MCP requires you to determine the nature and extent of your impacts, and the way that the airport was able to do it was based on the modeling because we knew that there was PFAS everywhere. We knew that there was these different signatures. We were able to trace our plume and track it, and we predicted if there's no other PFAS plume, which there are, um, what would this plume do and what would the concentration be? And that's the modeling that we talked about earlier where you know, up in this area here, you see gray. These are the higher concentrations. This is where the source is, and as the source moves with groundwater, it gets diluted and dispersed. More cleaner water is being added to it. And then, you know, by the time it's, it's halfway down, you know, the concentrations are now, you know, in the GW 
you know, this red, they're in the GW, exceeding GW1 concentration. And then as it continues to move down, 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 the concentrations are dropping, dropping, dropping until it gets to this point right here, which is kind of the maximum extent of the plume that's exceeding the regulatory standard. And then all the stuff that falls off is, is about half of the regulatory standard. So it's half than the GW1, which is the most protective um, for drinking water purposes. And then it's nowhere near the GW3 standard, which is protective of surface water. But this is going to be something that you know, other folks will need to do is to delineate the nature and extent of their plume to document how far it's gone. You know, so that's something that they should be doing. Uh, Mike, so you're heavily involved in what your PFAS is doing, but I, I guess from a neighbor's point of view here, a neighbor <coughs> community, why uh, are you, is there any collaborative work going on with the fire training academy people on this? So we've provided them this data. So they, you know, they've seen what we've done and, you know, how we've delineated the nature and extent of our plume. Um, you know, the airport was able to you know, figure this out pretty quickly. You know, we were very aggressive with what we were trying to do. And we figured out early on that the forensics were showing, you know, telling the story, so to say. And we started to say, well, let's collaborate this by looking elsewhere, hydraulically upgrading. The airport should have no connection to the industrial park. There's no hydraulic connection. But there's PFAS there. And the source from that, we don't know. But that was beyond what the requirements are from a regulatory perspective for what the airport needs to do. So the airport, consistent with the Massachusetts Contingency Plan, needs to delineate the nature and extent of their plume. And we did that by going outside of the airport's property to document that there was all of these other plumes and that what was being seen at Marwells 1, 2, and 3 was not just the airport. It wasn't the airport um, only that was causing these impacts. So we were bringing that to the attention of others. Um, this information has been given to the Fire Training Academy. They've come on to airport property um, to do some sampling, to do some well gauging. So uh, Katie's allowing them to use some of our existing wells that are already on airport property so that they can do uh, their own investigation. You know, from uh, an analytical data standpoint, I've looked at their analytical data and we generated radar plots for everything because that's, I needed to understand what their sources look like. Um, but again, you know, the delineated nature extent of their plume is kind of on their own is to, to figure that out, to determine, you know, how far down does their plume go? Is their plume, you know, exceeding GW1, you know, going further down? We know it exceeds at Marwells 1, 2, and 3, but the airport wasn't required to do more delineation because we've already tracked where the end point of the plume is. We already know that from a regulatory perspective, the GW3 impacts are stopping near on Marwell 2, and then beyond that, everything else is basically half that concentration, half the, the GW1 standard. And the monitoring that we're proposing to do during phase five is to continue monitoring Marwells 1, 2, and 3 to see if there's a change in signature. Because in about 10 years, there should be, because the airport's plume, you know, now that we've, if you saw on the graph, we've we stopped the, the continued leaching of the higher concentrations. Every time the groundwater goes up and down, it's flushing out those residual contaminants that are kind of in like the three feet above and, and below the groundwater. As the groundwater elevation goes up and down, it kind of flushes that out. And, you know, we're predicting that, you know, based on a nine year travel time from here to here, that once the flushing is complete, which is gonna hopefully happen pretty soon, will be another 10 years before this is gone and that the concentrations aren't exceeding it. So we're continuing to monitor these three wells. We've got wells in the middle so that we can verify our signature is consistent because one of the things that's important is proving that the 6-2 floor tolerant isn't degrading into something else and that it's stable. And over the last, um, when we sat doing this 2016, it's stable. It's not, it's not degrading. It's continuing to move. The only thing that you see now is a substantial drop at the source because it's no longer leaching into the groundwater because of the caps, but you still see it in the middle because it hasn't had a chance. There's still all this contaminated groundwater that's moving towards it. But over time, those concentrations will drop, and that's what we're continuing to monitor. So, 
So looking at all the timelines, do you know if there was ever a time that uh, the plume was making its way into our drinking supply unfiltered? The plume from the airport. So that question I can answer. So the treatment plan went online before the airport's plume impacted Marwell's. So the environmental forensic shows that the Marwell's, uh, or Marwell 2, this guy right here, uh, was impacted um, with the signature in 2022. Um, Dan can probably give you the exact date, but sometime in 2020, the uh, drinking water plant went into operation, correct? Yeah. So the airport's plume made it there two years after treatment was occurred. Treatment had been occurring. So by the time the airport's plume made it there, safe drinking water had already been being provided to the town. I got two other uh, puzzling pieces uh, that I have, Ryan. One is a uh, you know, point of uh, information. I think the, uh, the, uh, the flow time uh, from the treatment plant, um, if, if, if you look at the treatment plant, the uh, predominant flow, you know, the, the groundwater flow, as you might measure on a map, might be 32 some odd years, but the predominant flow pattern is to the south uh, east, uh, pretty much not towards the Mar Wells. If the only where I've seen it is if you do a zone two analysis and the zone two for, for the for the for the town has the has it which which is under extremely conservative assumptions, just has it touching the northern part of the uh, of the uh, of the treatment plant. So I, I don't think the, uh, the the treatment plant uh, is, is a part of the issue here at the Mar Wells. Um, I w will say the other piece is that uh, the uh, air rescue station with the concentration, with the storage, the preparation, the cleaning, the rinsing, the sump area that was uh, located there where, the, uh, where the, your work says that things drain to, the concentrations you measured at 120,000 total PFAS. And then the other thing is, is that uh, in the air, Port uh, PFAS study on Martha's Vineyard, they identified uh, the air station where they did these types of activities as one of the main main sources of uh, legacy plumes uh, from from the airport. And uh, you could say that's a different airport, but I, I think they're kind of similar and similar geology, similar level of activity, and uh, and I know that they uh, identified that and they're. Legacy PFAS plume is over, you know, it's nearly two miles long. Of course, they didn't have wells only 1,500 feet down grading. Right. So, one of the things I looked at into lots of detail is the particle tracking for the wastewater treatment plant, which is available. And when you look at the particle tracking, what happens with the particle tracking is the wastewater plant doesn't directly go to my well one, two, and three it feeds up this way, it does a big loop. So it goes, not with groundwater, it goes this direction and it feeds it this way. And then from that direction, it makes it down this way. So we looked at that in great detail and it's actually in one of the Fire Training Academy's reports. I think it's in the 2016 IRA where they did particle tracking for it and they show it in there and I also think it's available online in the studies that the town did. But the particle tracking show that it spiders out and goes all over the place. It goes multiple different directions because it's mounting the groundwater. But the hydraulic connection it has here is it's feeding it through the sides. So the, the particles are going up here and they get dispersed you know, up in this area here. They're not going directly down to my wells one, two, and three. That's not what it's doing. It's going up here and mixing with the groundwater up here and then traveling this way. And so that's kind of the first thing. And again, this was this was heavily evaluated during during our investigation. Um, you know, so that's kind of um, that point. The um, you know the second the second point that you know Tom was bringing up again that you know, there's no correlation to the two. Again, the, the analytical data tells a story. So analytical data is analytical data, and 
when you see these signatures that are so consistent, year after year after year after year, like the fire training academy, I looked at, you know, from 2015 up until last year, their signatures are the same. It's high, it's very consistent. The only time it started to change was recently when they have their remediation systems going, and then you see that there's a slight change. But there's years and years and years of multiple wells having these same chemical signatures. And it's because they weren't using the mill spec foam that the airport was using. The airport was using something completely different. You know, they had some 6,2-fluor tolomer in that foam. It could have been a contaminant from the process that made that foam. Um, you know, so again, there's there was multiple lines of evidence that was used to look at this, you know, well beyond, you know, just the analytical data. It was analytical data. It was contaminant feed and transport. It was soil results. The you know, every site is different. So just because um, you know, Martha's Vineyard had high levels at the airport rescue firefighting building, there's probably a reason for it. The airport would wash their equipment in the deployment area because of a fire hydrant there. So they would they would run their foam, spray their foam, then they could rinse their apparatus there. So the contaminants that we see down here are nowhere in the order of magnitude that are up here. So what we concluded is that what we see there is incidental drippage that may have occurred from when they hang their fire apparatus back in the building, you know, pre-2000. Uh, so for about five or six years, there were floor drains in the building that went right to this grass area. And, you know, any incidental drippage that may have occurred from that area would have gone to that. So we investigated that area. Again, we have monitoring wells going down here, multiple clustered wells. And again, we see the exact same signature. 6-2 fluorotolum is the predominant analyte, and it's traveling this way, but concentration is significantly less than up in the deployment area. And it's because it wasn't a direct application of foam, it was incidental drippage likely from fire apparatus that had already been washed out in the deployment area. So you had these lower levels. We did a, a test, uh, what Matt was talking about, from the fire trucks, where we found that there was this mechanism. So we said, well, what's coming out of these fire trucks when they're just spraying water? And we did the test, and it um, it exceeded the GW1 criteria. It wasn't super high, but it was slightly over it. So we fixed the mechanism. And again, the signature for that matches the airport signature exactly. The valve was replaced, and then you had less than GW1 coming out of the fire truck. So again, the the washing and all of that stuff was primarily occurring up in the deployment area, which is why you see the really high concentrations up there and then these lower concentrations down in this area, you know, which could have been, you know, they were doing another rinse or they were just pumping water through it and had these concentrations that, you know, they weren't straight foam concentrations, they were slightly over GW1 standards, but they had the airport signature in it. Clear as day, you can see the 60 floor tolerant. And those details are presented in, in our reports as well. So, you know, we looked at multiple things to really put together a picture for what likely happened, not to speculate, but to do multiple lines of evidence that all support this theory, which you know, analytical does, the third party testing from Patel does, um, the model does, the timelines do. Um, you know, again, every site is different. You know, the depth to groundwater, the amount of total organic carbon, all these things play a role in how these contaminants move. And it's all based on the analytical data that you have. And again, everything that we've done has been supported by the analytical data. Chris Pawicki, um, I'm a Brewster resident speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club. A um, couple questions, Brian. Um, so the soil contamination below the cap, what are the levels in the sediment and have they diminished at all and what's going to happen to them when the attenuation occurs downstream at the groundwater levels? What's going to happen to the defaults in the soil? So let me go back to So, I'm trying to jump on this side. So this figure right here, these are soil warnings, and then these concentrations, the bigger the circle, the deeper it is. 
So there's contamination, obviously, all the way to the groundwater interface here. And that's because of the application and it moving, application and moving. So you can see it, it kind of jumps all over the place, and that's to be expected. Now, what we've seen with the analytical data, let me see which slide that was. So what we did was the, the PFAS is getting into groundwater through rainwater that's infiltrating in the area with the high levels and then it's washing down. So what we did was we placed a, a non-permeable cap on it, we redirected stormwater flow away from these areas and allowed them to infiltrate into others so that the further migration of contaminants would stop. So this is a time, this is a time series graph. So this is the monitoring well that's, that's down where you You're right, the contaminants are there and they're being managed by the cap. And the cap is being inspected every six months to make sure that the cap is intact, the damage doesn't occur to the cap. And ultimately, the cap is an integral part of this and the inspections would occur. And if this site was to achieve regulatory closure, there would be an activity and use limitation to verify that the cap continues to work because it's, it's um, preventing the PFAS impacts in soil to continue to migrate. So this line right here is when the cap was installed. So the groundwater concentrations were heading up because as you pointed out, as groundwater goes up and down, it's smearing that couple feet that's above the current groundwater depth, the capillary frame zone. So there's these PFAS impacts that are sitting in soil above the groundwater table. And then we get rain and the groundwater table goes up. Well, those contaminants now are in the groundwater, then the groundwater drops and it gets flushed out. So what you see here is this is a trend with groundwater elevation going up and down. And what you see is the, is the correlation where when groundwater goes up, it's getting those contaminants in that smear zone, it's bringing it down, and it's washing the concentrations down. This was a high groundwater depth, so that's the groundwater went up really high, pulled those contaminants, it goes down. So we're thinking that this type of flushing is gonna to continue to occur probably over the next couple of years until that mass of PFAS that's in that three to five foot zone above groundwater is rinsed out. Then the cap prevents all of the other PFAS analytes from making it to that depth. And then what would happen is the plume would ultimately detach because it's not gonna be fed anymore because the sources would drop. So that's kind of what you see these ups and downs. So we had a relatively high concentration. Again, this is, this is total PFAS. This is 6.2 fluorotolomer. These are the regulated analytes. So again, you can see the predominant impacts here is the 6.2 fluorotolomer with the other stuff being contaminants from the airport, background from the area, atmospheric deposition, kind of all of these other things, <clears throat> excuse me, that play into this. So as time goes on, this flushing is occurring, concentrations are dropping. We just did another sampling event last month. I don't have the data yet, we just did it. And again, this, is, this gets put into our reports and we'll continue to, to go into our reports because we're monitoring and showing that it's actually working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's, it's preventing these higher concentrations from, from leaching out. And you know, again, the modeling over time uh, estimates that you know, once this leaching stops sometime in the next couple of years, that you know, another nine years will go by for the plume to do its full migration. And again, when we modeled the plume, we used the highest concentrations that had been detected to bias it high. So the, the model is assuming that this thing is still, is still leaching at that concentration and then stopped, and then that plume is, is running at that concentration. That answer question? Maybe? Um, I mean, the, the effective answer is that the, all the PFAS that's in the soil is not in that zone right now where it's going to get leached to the groundwater. Everything above that is going to stay there yes. indefinitely. That's the plan. Uh, for now. Okay. So when you say for now, um, what do you mean if you're, you're expecting closure to be reached? Doesn't that mean you walk away except for continued monitoring? I guess I'm trying to understand is this PFAS? contaminated soil going to be there indefinitely. And the reason I ask is because out at the base, um, early this year, DEP sent a, um, you know, a notice to one of the responsible parties there sent, saying basically you can't plan on leaving that forever because it will present a risk to the Cape Sol source groundwater forever. So to answer your question, the, the plastic liner itself has about a 200 year lifespan. That's what the, the plastic is estimated to last on. So if this was used as a treatment, 
it would have an activity and use limitation placed on it. So it would be clear that there's contaminated soil here with a cap and that to prevent risk, the cap needs to be maintained. So this cap would be maintained indefinitely under an activity and use limitation deed restriction unless um, you know there was a building or something that went on top of it and then you'd have a different type of cap. But that's, you know, that's the purpose of the cap and the purpose of an activity and use limitation is to put a deed restriction on it so that people know there is a cap here and that the cap needs to be maintained. So if the airport moves towards regulatory closure, groundwater concentrations have dropped, we know the cap works. This is common with landfills. You know, landfill gets capped and they monitor it for 30 years and then it's done. Um, this is kind of the same thing. The, the cap would be inspected biannually to verify that its integrity is there, that it you know, isn't being damaged, and then it gets reported as a deed. So there's safeguards in place to verify that you know they don't, someone just doesn't walk away and leave this contamination here and nobody knows. It's, it's filed with the deed to the property and it becomes a reporting obligation for the owner to mass DEP to annually inspect these caps or by annual inspecting. So it's not that they would just walk away and leave this contamination there. It would be part of ongoing monitoring even after they achieve regulatory closure. Right, but it'll, it'll still be there indefinitely. It would still be there until it became feasible to remove or technology changes or something like that happens. That's okay, um, another question. Um, so, as I understand it, um, the airport's plume reached the Mar Wells in 2022. Uh, water treatment occurred beginning in 2020. So, um, is it your contention there's a 100% guarantee that the airport's plumes never impacted? Uh, based on the analytical data, yes, that's what the analytical data shows. The analytical data uh, shows that we attract the plume to about 700 feet away from our wells in 2020. Um, we weren't seeing the airport's chemical signature there. Can you use the microphone? Yeah, sorry. Right. Yes. Yep. So uh, when we started our phase two investigation, we had this 800 foot gap. We had tested the Mar wells and we knew that. The airport signature wasn't there, but it was uh, about 700 feet hydraulically operating. So there was this gap, and the gap was private property that we couldn't get on to drill. There was no town right of way. So a lot of these monitoring wells were installed in town right of ways because they allow access. Um, so when we did our hydraulic monitoring based on um, pump tests, based on modeling, based on retardation coefficients, because these PFAS analytes move differently in the aquifer, they don't all move at the same rate. We estimated that in about two years, the plume would get there. And we continued monitoring, and then in two years, the signature was there. So that's supported by what we've seen. You know, the analytical data supports this. We also know that they, they had a fluorotelomer-based foam, uh, which, you know, predominantly analyzed 6 to fluorotelomer. Um, and that's what we were able to track. And we weren't seeing those impacts closer to my well. So there was, you know, groups of wells right in front of the Marwell fields, and we weren't seeing those impacts there either, but they were very close. They were on water department property. Um, so then if, it, if, it's, if it's not the airport's contamination, then it's either the unknown, possibly from the wastewater treatment plant, uh, or it's the county higher credit training academy that is impacting the Marwells. Is that my process of elimination? That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and has the um, the county now been given access to to, to your um, monitoring wells? Because when we went attended a, um, I guess the, the the last meeting the county held, I think was late July. They said they hadn't been given access to airport property or data. So has that changed recently? They have had two events that I'm aware of. They just had one. Within, yeah, two weeks ago they just had one, and then they had another one. I can't five, six months ago. So they've they've accessed the wells twice. We we coordinated with them. They said we wanted to access these wells, and, and the airport provided them access. And they also have access to all of the laboratory results from our website and DP's website. Sure. Yeah, I think that gets to the the question earlier about our the county and the airport and the town collaborating and I think that that's sort of on its way but it has a long way to go um, I guess I'm wondering if you have um, monitoring wells like 
basically along the property line through the, the county plume, were you able to detect any effects um, in their plume from their pump and treat system? Are you detecting that their uh, level of contamination that's entering uh, you know, below ground the airport property that is declining into their system? So I was primarily looking at it from a forensics point of view. So I wasn't trying to determine if their plume concentrations were dropping. What I was trying to do was to determine if the chemical signatures were consistent. And if you have a, a known source and you start remediation and you start to drop the concentrations, you would expect proportionately the signature won't change, but the concentration would proportionately. And that's what the data has shown, that um, year after year after year, the signatures are are extremely, are extremely consistent. Um, you know, I've seen some slight changes um, recent, the last year or so. Um, again, they're still pretty much the same, uh, but there may be one or two wells that changes, and that could be an actual treatment or other things. But again, not what we were really looking for. We were more trying to show stability of the plume signature. I'm not sure if this is a question for you or for somebody else, but in but do we know when um, PFOS reached the Mar well and how long it was in the well? Um, same thing with the uh, Maridan wells. Do we know when it, the contamination started and how long Marshall residents were exposed? The only data point that I can give you is the one from EPA in 2015, which is what started all of this. So prior to that, I, I'm not sure. Just one last question. So, um, you mentioned that the you know, the caps are there; they're not going to be disturbed. Um, the airport the airport is, has a master plan process underway. Um, it's got a, a draft environmental impact report out for review, um, and um, some of the activities in that master plan, in that construction plan, um, are involving you know soil removal, uh, asphalt removal, um, activities right along the edge of the areas where the capped areas are and I think the um, report indicates that some 200,000 yards of soil are going to be handled um, I guess you know my question is why um, leave the PFAS in the soil um, if there's going to be such a big construction project there um, a couple of years ago there was a decision just to cap and not remove at that time was that revisited that that thought of <coughs> capping has that been revisited and, and if the airport is going to go through this master plan process with all kinds of construction and soil um, and asphalt uh, removal, um, why not take care of the PFAS while we're at it next? So to answer that question, one of the previous slides shows these yellow boundaries around the airport's two soil contamination areas. Any future work, whether the site achieves regulatory closure or not, is going to get done under a piece of payment measure. So any soil disturbance, any construction, anything that happens in that area would be done under a release abatement measure plan, which means the soil would be, um, the excavation would be documented under the direction of NLSP. So again, the, there's two current options for soil. You can cap it or you can send it to a landfill. Sending it to the landfill is putting it somewhere else where it's going to be capped. So, Landfills do the same thing. They do environmental monitoring, environmental testing to prove that their caps are adequate. Um, so if future construction is in that area and it requires soil to be sent off-site, um, that soil will be managed under the direction of an LSP. It would go to an appropriate disposal facility, which is likely going to be a hazardous waste landfill. Um, and then new caps would be constructed. You know, those areas always need to be capped. So if it's um, a building, and the building serves as a cap, and the AUL gets updated. Um, if it's asphalt, then it's an asphalt cap, and the asphalt gets inspected. So the way that the regulatory requirements are is that any area, and that's why we put those yellow boundaries on the figures, is so that you know, 20 years from now, I'm not an LSP anymore, I'm retired, and somebody else is working on the project, they can look on the figure and say, oh, okay, they, they delineated the extent here, and anything that's in these yellow boxes requires work under a RAM. So um, during the master plan process, I know uh, Katie's consultants are aware of this and that you know, those details would be followed. So if there is, to say, a, a building, right, that's going to go into the deployment area, 
if the soil can't be managed on site, capped on site for whatever reason because of grades or other requirements, because there are grading requirements because it's an airport, um, then that material will be handled appropriately and sent to an appropriate disposal facility and managed there. And then the cap would be replaced with the building. Because again, these impacts extend, you know, 20 feet below grade. Um, and the, the caps at the surface are just preventing that ongoing filtration of the surface water. So will those activities, if any, during the construction process that impact the soil, um, will they come back to you as the LSP and you essentially and DEP have control over what happens or do they get done sort of separately? Thanks, thanks for the opportunity to ask. No, no problem. Um, great question. So right now, um, the airport's um, license, price, license site professional record for this site. So if construction was to happen, you know, tomorrow, then I would manage that work under, you know, it would get submitted to Mass DEP. It would get submitted to all of you because this is a website. site. So RAM is another one of those reports that um, is a, considered like a milestone major report that the public could comment on. So if um, during the master plan process, you know, there's going to be a building, I'm just making this up, a building that's going to be constructed um, in the deployment area, then um, that plan would get put together. There would be a dust monitoring aspect of it, just like we did before. Um, there would be um, soil management protocols put in place for appropriate disposal facility. There'd be analytical testing and profiling, and all of that uh, information would get documented in the RAM plan, and then we would make an update um, to what the monitoring is going to be. So if you know if we rip out the cap and we take out that entire footprint of the cap because it needs to during construction, <coughs> that entire area always needs to be capped. So there would have to be some sort of combination of asphalt, uh, geomembrane. Or like a building slab, a building slab works just as well, and then groundwater would be redirected from these areas. Um, you would not infiltrate groundwater in any of these areas um, that are in the yellow boundary, and that's pretty clear in, in other documentation. That, you know, groundwater, uh, stormwater would be redirected to other areas, uh, outfalls for like Lewis Pond and for other areas that they wouldn't be infiltrated. Anybody have any other Sure. Final question. So it's my understanding that there was a joint meeting held between the county and the airport sometime after the summer. Um, is that a true statement? Yes. True. The public was not allowed to attend that meeting. Is that true also? I don't know that detail. That was, sorry. So that was a DEP meeting. Um, some of the folks that are here with us tonight uh, requested that we get in the room together with the Barnstable Fire Training Academy so they could learn what the airport has done through our forensic work um, and then ask us any additional information that they needed from us to help them with their studies. So as Brian alluded to, we're at phase four. This is phase four that we're asking for public comment on. Um, right now, the Barstool Fire Trade Academy is at phase two. So we started about the same time. We just have collected a lot of data for the airport that they can reutilize in their testing studies, in their um, reports to DEP. The purpose of that was more internally to make sure that um, they knew the information that we had. They could ask us any clarifying questions that they may have there. I don't know if there will be a future public meeting with Barnstable Fire Training Academy or others, uh, other industrial sites to get information from them. I'm not sure at this point. We've responded for the airport's portion that is uh, accountable for our PFOS. Okay. Um, so my reason for asking this is, I guess, is has a lot to do with the delay that the that we're seeing from the fire training academy and the county on this. So the residents uh, are hungry for information about where they stand. Um, some of us are starting to get our results back from the PFAS study that took place. Um, I just got my results back, and they're not good from the blood tests. Um, my husband's as well so we're looking we're looking for data we're looking for information we're looking to figure out you know where the contamination came from 
yes, there's nothing that can be done about it now, uh, uh, but we'd really like to see more disclosure from the county, from the fire training academy, from the town. I, I, I actually feel like the airport's done a pretty amazing job disclosing to us exactly what they've been doing and all the testing that you've been doing, and I thank you for that. But more and more residents are going to be getting their results back, and they're going to be looking for answers. And we, I feel like they're owed, they're, there's a responsibility out there to give answers to them. So I'd like to make that request to please, you know, if you can help us get the, get the Fire Training Academy and the county to give us more data to speed this up, um, to help us figure out what our, our um, you know, uh, where we can go to, 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 to find answers for all of this so that it doesn't happen again. My other request is that we get ahead of the federal government. Um, these plumes are moving toward the water. They're moving toward the bay. Um, they're going to get there. They're going to get into the fish. They're going to be in the swimming water. They're going to be in the in the shellfish that's out there. Once it gets into the bay, the channels are going to take it. God, I don't know where it's there. Where the channels will take it. So more and more people are going to be affected by this. I understand that from what you're saying tonight that by the time that the airport pea plume reaches the water, it's going to be very diluted. I don't know if we can say that about the plumes from the Fire Training Academy. So I, I'd love to see this town and this county get ahead of the federal government and um, start putting their own standards in place in the in anticipation of that happening from the federal government at some point so that we can save our water. We, our, our blue economy, our tourism economy is reliant upon us having water that's safe to eat, you know, eat the seafood from and to swim in and to, to walk on. So that's... Thank you. Um, for DB not to put you on the spot, do you have any comments for that? Just um, what Betsy Young brought up? Do you want to speak to that at all? The meeting that we held, um, the region The meeting that we held with John Anderhan from Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, the meeting that we had held in the fall with the county and the airport, um, the regional director felt there was an opportunity for collaboration and to try to get everybody on the same page in the same room. Lessons learned. Um, as you've seen today, the airport is ahead of where the county is in figuring out their PFAS situation. So she saw an opportunity for the two sides to try to to try to talk and, and can collaborate in that regard. Um, so it was sort of a technical meeting. There was no new data there. There was no new analysis there. It was very similar to all the reports that have been submitted to the department, both from the county standpoint and from the airport standpoint. Um, just an opportunity for everybody to try to get on the same page a little bit. So that collaboration that you spoke to, the regional director thought that there was an opportunity for that. Will that continue? Uh, where there is opportunity and where we see there's, there's some lessons learned and some, some opportunity for that, I'm sure it will, yes. Does Mr. Santos have any comments about that? I'm just no. Could we possibly have another meeting where more public can be involved so that we can get the science community? From, I mean, we have state-of-the-art right here it, it, it would school uh, coastal studies. I mean, we have everything we need. We need to do a serious collaboration, get students involved, get our college students involved in four seas, get our, our students at Sturgis involved, everyone involved. Yes. That, but we need an opportunity. Uh, when it comes to, I mean, and it's great that you came out here, but we need another opportunity to, to, to meet with you, to continue this effort. Sure. Uh, we are always available for if you have any questions and you want to talk to the department, we are always available to have those conversations. And I think you've probably talked to, many people in this room have talked to my teammates, um, Angela and Nev Preet, um, on these issues. Uh, so we will continuously be sort of at the table. As far as another meeting with a larger scope, 
I'm, I'll, I will bring that those comments That'd back. I'll bring those comments back to, to my boss, the regional director, and we will figure out if there is an opportunity for that and how that could work. Like when the state of Massachusetts has EFSB at the, at the community college, it's a perfect venue for us to, to meet again and have a lot more of the public involved. Sure. Because it's very important, especially with what's going on now with the wind farm. We are very concerned about our water here in Cape Cod. And anything, anytime we get an opportunity where the, where the DP is, will do a, an open meeting, we're going to collaborate and solve this problem. And we need that. We need that public meeting. It's so vital to, for us to continue to fight this problem that we have. So, Thank you. Yep. Thank you, John. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I wanted to thank you tonight just for the presentation materials. It's exceedingly helpful in a room where sometimes the screen is hard to see, and I just really thank you for the packet. Um, it was very nicely done and really much appreciated. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, one of the things, too, I'm not sure if, if um, it was announced at the beginning, so forgive me for repeating myself, but um, this presentation will be available uh, online. It's being recorded um, so that you know, future people can watch it if, if need be. Um, that will be uh, on the airport's website. Anybody else? Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your questions. I truly appreciate it. And uh, like Brian said, we'll have everything available on our website. Uh, this presentation will be available um, probably tomorrow morning. I'll put it up. Um, and then uh, Stone with the with the uh, town. I'm not sure when we'll get the re recorded video, but as soon as it's available to us, we'll put it on our PFOS page. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And public comments on this? Plan or yes. Do or something, something Thank you for practice. asking that. Uh, January 19th. So um, again, uh, hopefully that gives everybody enough time to, to review. Um, but again, if there's questions, uh, my email contact information is out there. Feel free to, to reach out.